And welcome to the Revelation Podcast. I'm the host of it, John Borman, and thank you for clicking play to listen on what I'd like to share with you. I've been going on a series called Christ Basics, and to see our home verse, let's look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. An instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Where we are at with this series, we are at the first doctrine of Christ, salvation. That is seen in the phrase of not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Repentance is when we turn away from our sins. We ask Jesus to forgive us. Dead works refers to our sins that we have been working through the flesh since birth. And a faith toward God is belief in our hearts, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. All those things I said are things composed the doctrine of salvation. Now, we looked at from atonement to sin to Jesus' blood. And in this audio, we will look at why was Jesus the chosen one for our sins. Well, he was perfect. And throughout the link of this audio, you will see that testimony throughout the New Testament. And him being perfect meant that he knew no sin. Well, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, revealed that Jesus was tempted. And let's take a look at that passage. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. The temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now the temptation of Jesus is also written in Luke chapter 4. And I want us to look at that briefly. In Luke chapter 4, it has all the temptations that Jesus faced like in Matthew chapter 4. And towards the end of it, if you look at verse 13, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So, Jesus was tempted more than what we've read in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. And it's probably fair to say that he was probably tempted more than anybody else just because of who he is. Think about the next time that you face temptation. You know, Jesus faced temptation and he overcame. He knew no sin. So that should encourage us the next time that we are tempted. Because by the power of his blood, we can overcome. Now, we're going to take a look more at the blood of Jesus eventually. We will take a look at his blood and we'll see that his blood was 
different. Yet, I want us to focus on the passages that point out that Jesus did not sin so we could see why he was a chosen one to die for our sins. So in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and 23, says this. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued to trust himself to him who judged justly. And Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the age began. So Paul testified again there was no sin in Jesus and that he never told a lie. Now we go in the first Peter chapter one, verse fifteen. First Peter chapter one, verse fifteen is basically a quote from Leviticus. But first to Jesus, but as he, Jesus, who called you is holy, Jesus is holy. He said he is holy and others such as Apostle Peter testify that he is holy. Jesus sets an example for us so that we can be holy in all your kindness. And it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. The perfect life that Jesus lived is why he could be the one that dies for our sins. And going back into Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. And again, it refers to him being tempted. For he, because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He's not like the earthly high priest that had a sin nature, and that's why he's able to relate to them and help them. Jesus relates to us because he too was tempted, and he could also help us because he knew no sin. His blood was perfect, so that's why his blood was enough for the atonement of our sins. There we go. Again, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it explains more why Jesus is the one that could die for our sins. It says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He, Jesus, he is the appropriation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So that's why. All nations will be blessed by him because Jesus not only just died for Israelites, God's chosen people, but he died for all of our sins. And I'll close it with Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 and 28, so that why we can see why Jesus was the chosen one for the atonement of our sins. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, referring to Jesus, holy, innocent, unsustained, separated from sinner, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and the vows of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appointed men in their weakness as high priest. But well, the word of the oath, which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. 
So with the Bible, we see we see why. Why is Jesus the chosen one? Now we will take or next time, should I say, we will look and see how did Jesus suffer to see how much our sins have cost God the Father.